did everything out of necessity. I see where things are going. I seen where they were going before the Brandon years started. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, going back to my channel here, Brad, make a long story short, you can get typecast. Well, my channel took off on the wood gas stuff. I had, it got real big real quick. I was like, oh, wow. Okay. This is get, getting interesting. You know, I'm having people, even when I go out sometimes locally, will we'll go, hey, man, are you the wood gas guy? And, uh, <laughs> Or I called into a radio show, and I'm not going to say which one it was. I'll say he's the he he's the one that people um, have um, what's the good way of putting it censored and totally got rid of. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, nine eleven and inside job. This could be one of his t-shirts to sell. <laughs> I will not name the unnamed one, but uh, I called into that show one day and had people reach back out to me. Right, because they recognized my voice from the videos. Goes, um, hey man, are you the wood gas dude? <laughs> and I never, I didn't call myself Flash when I called into the show, right. and and uh, that kind of, that kind of was kind of scary. I had a couple people reach out and go, dude, I recognize that voice. You're the wood gas dude. And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, I guess I am. I'm the Tin Man, you know. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> so um, I realized then. I said, man, I knew the channel had a lot of people viewing it and buddy since brandon took office this channel has come back to life it's hopping again i'm answering right. questions every day on this but um right. everything i've done was out of necessity going back to the typecasting when i started my channel off it was with electronics then i wound up doing the wood gas that thing i did a couple years of running doing that and um then i started doing other stuff man i but you know i went on to other projects that i was working on including setting up solar and boy, you would have thought, like, was it Bob Dylan when he went to Acoustic Electric? Everybody's like, oh, I hate you. You you, you betrayed us. You know, I don't right, know if you know right. that story, but. um. Yeah, yeah, uh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, it was like that. I was like, and I, I know people come up saying hateful stuff to me. I was like, you get over it. I said, this channel is not about. I said, that's just, I wear many hats. You know, you know me, man. That's the way I've always been. Um, it's, you know, if something captures my attention i'm going to i'm going to follow it to the end which i want to right. go back to the something we talked about earlier here in a second that doesn't have anything to do with this yeah i mean i started doing stuff for the solar because i knew that it to, to to be independent and i had to have more than one avenue for power the solar which right now um i'm now set up officially set up barely but I, i'm really off grid with everything i can sit here and i can go off grid go off grid at will just um, go outside, flip the power over. And so I'm running about eight to nine hours a day, running the house off grid, all the small stuff. I can't run the heat pump or the electric stove, but that's going to be converted over the propane as far as the stove goes. And mm -hmm. uh, if I had to, I could run window units. And this is off the baby system. I built up a small system, you know, Brad, a while back to run my shop with. I took my shop off grid a couple years back and immediately seen $35, $40 difference in my, in my electric bill. And mm -hmm. um, uh, about a, a couple of weeks, well, actually, this today's the fourth day that I finally set it up. But I've had all the solar panels to be able to double the power on the shop. I've had them for years and just haven't done anything with them. Well, so I finally sat down and a week ago, I finally set it up, doubled up the panels for my shop and realized, hey, man, I got enough power here to run the house and the shop with the sun shining. I got a transfer switch set up. I can flip over and run off a generator or the solar in my case, but the gasifier. And for any of you out there that are going to be watching on my channel, all this stuff's hand in hand. Um, the, if, if I had a whole bunch of rain days, solar's not going to do me any good. And if things go really far south, well, guess what? I can crank up that wood gasifier. It's there. It's on the go. It's ready to go whenever I need it. And I can make it run every time because I've got the feel on this thing. And I can make it happen, and I'm always going to have power here. Mm -hmm. And that's, oh, yeah. and it's being self-sufficient. Not only that, hold on, this chair collapsed on me. Not only that, um, you know, I upload garden videos to my channel. You know, people mm -hmm. like tell me, what the hell is this? Now, granted, I've, a, a bunch of people get it, and a bunch of my good, uh, good friends that do wood gas, they're like me. They're they're preppers, buddy. Uh, gardening, uh, canning, everything else. And I, I always grew gardens, man. I've, I've grown gardens since I was 
uh, 12 and 13 years old. Man, it was a family thing. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I got back about, well, in 2017 when I, when I was in that accident and I was out of work for all that time. Um, yeah, I started gardening again. I never quit. And I've canned stuff. We've canned stuff here and put it back. So this is all about not having to depend on anybody else. Then people need to get that into their mind. Everything has a reason and a, and a rhyme to it. You know, wood gas, uh, solar panels, gardening, um, it, it all comes together and it all meets at a central point. You know what that is? Independence. Cover, independence, covering your backside. That's absolutely right. I'll shut up here, yeah. man, because I, I can rumble no. until I lose breath. No, no. I, you know, like I said, man, I mean, we've, we've been on the air how long so far? About 30, 45 minutes? About forty-one minutes. So I'm. I'll keep going. Okay. If you want to. Yeah. I tell you what. Let's take a little break. We'll go ahead and do a part two. We're gonna break this down. So you know, because we did the gasifier, and I think on the next one we're gonna discuss some of the other projects that you know, you know, we've worked on together. You know, and uh, and kind of give people an idea. Okay, this kind of stuff. This is what. This is just a what a couple of you know, southern boys in a you know in a no name town just you know pitting around coming up with you know the kind of things we've you know we've, <laughs> we've on. So it, it's been interesting. Uh, it's been I can a... see you laughing because the people only freaking knew. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave oh, it at that, man. man. Yeah, I'll leave it at that too. That yeah, th- those are good days. Uh, yeah, yeah, I missed it. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so yeah, people right, have man. no freaking idea. All right, we're gonna pause here. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and uh, yeah, you can go ahead and shut it off, and we'll uh, do a part two. All right. Well, we're back here for part two. And, uh, you know, we spent the first part of this uh, show talking about the gasifier. And uh, I thought, what the hell? We'll just tell people some of the things that, you know, we kind of worked on in the past. Uh, one thing that really I thought was intriguing. And, uh, you know, I was basically, I was the guy that was getting all the parts for you and whatever. And you explained it to me. And, hell, I was even, I even got a, a journal that I kept on this project. Here's about this thick. And I would go over and over again trying to, you know, why is this? Why does this thing appear to be doing one thing, but in reality, it's not? You know, we didn't know that at the time. We were trying to prove that this thing was actually, uh, I guess, as you put it, a very efficient power supply. And I went through everything, and I finally broke down. I kind of, in a cryptic way, without giving away the, you know, giving away the entire show, I uh, wrote to a, a website that had electrical engineers on the thing, and I explained basically what this was. And they said, "Oh, that's the capacitor paradox." And they sent me like two or three papers that people have PhDs on this and a capacitor paradox. Well, I tell you what, let's uh, let you tell everybody what is a capacitor paradox there, young man. Well, apparently um, the the power in a capacitor, if you charge one up, look at it like a bucket of water. You put five gallons in it. Okay. Technically, you could run that capacitor into a another capacitor that was totally discharged and run that through a load while you're doing it. And let's say you started off with 12 volts in the capacitor. I'm not going to mm-hmm. get into joules and coulombs and all these different. I'm, I'm going I'm to keep this in layman terms. Put it in your terms, what you told an engineer when they first came up with flight. Um, everything was, you had a word for it. It's named after barns and, and other, other things that you'd find on a farm. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah, like the, uh, he and ha, like uh, like what you would tell a mule to go left or right when you're plowing a fill. Yeah, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, and yeah. also a lot of the modern terminology was spin off of that. Well, exactly. Um, so a capacitor paradox would be that hey, look, okay, you had a load, and I actually built a, a built a working model of this up, and let's say you charge that capacitor to 12 volts, and um, let's say you got another capacitor that's the same value that's completely discharged. Now you hook a load in it, and if you do a power run of the curve or, or you run, the load becomes part of the circuit to charge the other capacitor. It doesn't matter if it's a, if it's a, a, a load that's only one or two ohms or a dead short or a couple of K, a couple thousand ohms or whatever. Um, doesn't matter how long it takes for the capacitor on, that's charged to pass through the load, whether it's uh, quickly or over time, you wind up with six volts in each cap and you're thinking to yourself, well, hell, there's my 12 volts, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, not only that, you created heat on that resistor when you 
ran through there, or if you had a little wheat bulb, you lit it up for, and the light dimmed out, then the capacitors leveled off. Okay. Well, technically, you did work with that 12 volts. And um, if you turn back around and take that capacitor and power the light directly with it, you can do a power run of the curve and go, okay, well, I had this many, um, you know, electrons, whatever you have, you want to look at it, do a power run of the curve shows the power that came from the capacitor that ran through the light. And it's going to, going to be, a, you know, a, just a curve nonlinear. It's going to go and curve out. And, you know, so most electric, electrical engineers will tell you, well, look, you know, if you do this, what you're talking about, if you charge a capacitor off a capacitor through the load you, and then you discharge that capacitor through the load a second time, if you add both power of the curves up, it equals the first power of the curve if you just didn't use but one capacitor and run it through the load period. And you're absolutely right. Well, here's mm -hmm. where all here's where all this goes south. OK, if you got eight ounces of water in a cup and you put that into a half of that into a second cup, how many ounces of water do you have total? <laughs> you still have eight ounces. OK, have, yeah. and minus the minus the losses, which the losses would be the water that stuck to the side of the glass that you couldn't drip out right. of the drops. So we'll call that right. the losses in the inefficiencies of the components. Well, here's where that fall, can slightly fall apart. Or at least I think it does. I'm not going to say it's written in stone. Okay. You take a capacitor, you charge it up, you power a light bulb with it, you do a power run of the curve. You go, okay, well, this is my power. Well, that's just simple math formula to do that. And you go, right. okay, well, this is my area under here represents the power. Or you take a capacitor and you take that capacitor and you charge it up and you hook it to the power supply, you charge it up while it's powering the load. And then you you got that power under the curve, but then you discharge it, and it has a, another another power under the curve. Technically, if you add that up, it equals what the power supply originally gave up. Right. This is where the paradox comes on. Okay. Well, if that's the case, how do you wind up with four ounces in this cup and four ounces in this cup? And this got me to thinking. You know, um, I had actually built up a system. And we were buying um, true RMS meters. You were getting all this stuff, and the meters were getting better. And um, at first, I didn't know what I was doing when I was doing it. But when I was still working, when I was before I had retired, um, I would go to my job after hours. You knew this. I had built something up that took a different approach with it, and I kept coming up with 130 percent efficiency. Not enough to make right. a closed loop with it, but damn sure enough. To see it on the meters and we're dealing with dc although it was non-linear waveforms it was still dc the meters right. were designed as a matter of fact i spoke with the engineers at hewlett packard when we bought these meters i spoke to the engineers i said and told them these are the waveforms i want to measure and they assured me hey look if you can measure you can measure static on these meters and it's going to give you true rms have power i knew they were right about that and um so I built this thing up and I thought, well, damn, man, okay, this is crazy. I'm coming up with this. I'm seeing this. Now, this is after you had got your information. Okay, well, this is, you know, there's there's nothing there. It's a spoof. But, you know, I'm not, I can't say that the people that wrote this up about the, the capacitor paradox took it through every regimen that they could to test it. And right. that was the problem I had. As a matter of fact, um, um, I will name one engineer by first name only that we were dealing with two electrical engineers. One was a, yeah. a college teacher that taught people to be engineers. And um, he was the one that explained to me, look, um, monitor the, the voltage waveform and the current waveform. You got a 12 volt supply here. The capacitor you're going to charge is at zero volts. Put a load in between that capacitor and the power supply. Turn it on. The capacitor technically is a dead short as it charges the lights at its full brightness that it dims down in a non-linear way in, uh, in a fashion until the capacitor charges up to 12 volts mm -hmm. and he said okay now if you measured that power that came the from the power supply to charge up and then you turned around and you discharge that same capacitor that's got that 12 volts in it to the same light and you do a second power under the curve that you will turn around and realize that all of it came from the power supply. 
And, you know, of course, you did that by going, okay, um, 12 volts time the, the, the steps of the capacitor charging down. And, of course, when you're discharging the cap, you don't have the 12 volts. It's nonlinear. The voltage and the current are dropping at the same time. Right. And so I thought, well, I'm going to screw with this guy. So I took my, my power supply and I put a, a solid state relay in it so that the power supply, um, and by the way, I monitored the current draw on the power supply, the A, because he was like, we have to go all the way back to the power company. I was like, well, we're going to do one better than that. So I had a switch on it where I could flip it up and the DC was either 100% on or it was only, uh, it, it was only on um, in, in pulses. That mm-hmm. the, the, mm-hmm. I, I did this, I did it like this. And what I was able to show him is, look, you're right with the formula, but if that's the case, I should see the power drop on the consumption of the power supply. Power supply is telling me that I took only this much power. And I blew his mind with it. As a matter of fact, by the time we built this thing up, because he was, you know, he was looking at me like, oh, let me tell you how it's done, son. You know, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I was, I, I wasn't an electrical engineer, you know, but yeah, the dude, yeah, this guy been, was a tr- yeah, this guy was a yeah. triple E. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I go, dude, I go back to doing this. I was messing with electricity and learning about it when I was six years old. And I mm-hmm. can design. And I am technically an associate engineer now. I, yes, I can design, but it's not something that I care to do. But I do it out of necessity for my own stuff. So to make a long story short, we built this device up. And the engineer had it. He was nice, but he was arrogant, like uh, talking to us like, Come here, children. Let me explain this to you. So we went to the college. He hooked it up. And he looked at us. He he wasn't sure. He started questioning his own equipment. You remember this. So now he goes, we're going to go do this a different way. He said, "Um, I'm going to we're going to split the test up in half. He said, "Um, we had another triple E engineer that said, I'm going to do the math on it. So we took it to the college. The college ran the power supply. He captured the voltage and current through time. He, he did it in a spreadsheet. And then we took the spreadsheet to a second engineer. And before it was said and done, the second engineer was going, well, man, this, this guy obviously did something wrong on his end. He's, he's got to look at his equipment. He obviously, he, he hooked something up wrong. He didn't do the test right. Well, the first engineer, his big claim to fame was he was part of designing power distribution systems, like for power companies, like for Hoover Dam. Yeah. And yeah. stuff like that. This right. other engineer was a, a brainier genius too, that could do the same thing. But he took it in a different direction with computer and automation. But um, by the time it was all said and done, they went from calling this a power supply. Well, uh, we need to talk to some other people. We're going to tell them, hey man, that we got this box, and we put this in it, and we got this out of it, <clears throat> and that's where it ended with them. They yeah. kind of like, well, we the hell if we know what the hell is going on. Yeah. You know, and we're the idiots. And they couldn't okay. explain it. Yeah. And but it came down to that their calculations came damn close to I think it was like 125 to 130%. Did us what yeah. I, when I went back and and this is before I had the meters, the correct meters to do it. When I right. went back with with we got all the um the meters so we could track stuff and true RMS meters. I came up with the same configurations and it came up with the same um, the same math. I was like, man, I'm coming up with 130 percent to this day. I never have walked away from that. I still think there's something to it, but um, yeah. it's, you it's remember kind I had, of like, go ahead. Yeah, you remember I had to do that power under the curve, you know, that chart, that graph. We took a piece of graph paper. Oh, and we had, that's, yeah, oh, had that's a, show, we did it with heat, brother. Yeah, that that's what showed, it said, a 30 percent increase. And that heat. showed 100. We did it with and that was with Nick. A third engineer, a third yeah. electrical engineer that that worked with who? He worked with, uh, let's see, uh, Texas Instruments. He was like the he was the Silicon Valley whiz kid, and he was one of the people involved with the 555 timer. Five uh, timer, yeah. He's, I, I think most of that came out of his head. As a matter of fact, he was the one that came up with build a bomb calorimeter, which for those out there, even if you do electronics or electrical, you may not know what this is. Basically, it's um. Imagine using a thermos or something where you can control temperature and you put your electrical load in this thing. And on this thing, you also have a reference thermometer that measures the outside ambient temperature 
this way you have uh, you can do calculations down to the letter. OK, um, what was the temperature of our inside of this thing where we're going to do the electrical test because you heat it up with whatever power you're putting in it and you watch the power under the curve cool down with it, you're doing it with temperature instead of voltage and current. And this tells you how much you can get an idea how much power you produced. You can get a very accurate idea with it without using uh, current voltage calculations. And the outside mm -hmm. thermometer, uh, you use that as your reference. This also tells you how to, this also gives you reference of, okay, how do I calculate losses or the instability of a room, which we didn't have to deal with that. Our room is stable, but we had it on there anyhow, but just to make our tests more for real. I'm looking at the thing right now. I've got this thing and I've had it uh, 20 years in over here. So we built a, a bomb calorimeter up. We did this capacitor test through it. You did the power run of the curve. Then we turned around and did it running it through the box. The box came up 130%. Nick then said, now we're going to produce hydrogen. And he said, so I built up a, uh, another unit that had probes inside of it. And basically, it, it produced oxygen and hydrogen. It was filled full of water. He said, this is foolproof, too. He said, you do, you rake, you charge a capacitor up. You, but that's what we use for a battery, a capacitor. We charge the right. capacitor up. We discharged it into this, um, into this hydrogen producer. We measured how much mm -hmm. gas was produced. And then we turned around and ran the capacitor as a battery through the box, and we produced more hydrogen. And... Um, I was like, well, OK, this is really freaking interesting. So we had yeah. two tests that proved that we we got more out of what we put into it. The problem was, and where we sit today, it's not practical because we really can't do anything of any practical use with it, which is why I started throwing inductors into it and I started getting really elaborate with it. But trying to keep it simple and um, keep this thing, I tried to make it into a power system where I could switch it quickly and make these things happen so that I could extract power from it and, and put this put this baby to bed, put it to rest once for all. And um, the last time I had tested it, I, I was putting out more than I was putting into it. I wanted to clean the system up and make it more user-friendly. I guess that'd be a word to put on it to see if I could get more out of it that I'm getting. Um, mm -hmm. that's where I got it. I was, I was really looking at headed to a, a closed loop system or something like that with it. Never got it there, you know, I, but, but yeah, I think, I think there was something done with it. I think, I think, I think we showed that there, there is an ability to get out more than you put into it or make something incredibly, incredibly efficient. But I think, I think we, it's what we did. Yeah, I think, I think we, I, my gut tells me we did a little bit more than that, but not enough to make this thing practical where it could be used for something. That's what mm -hmm. what I believe in my heart of hearts. Yeah, well, you know, again, we're just dealing with you know the modern technology and a, and a lot of parts we're having to put together that really weren't the most efficient things in the world. I mean, we're we're trying, you know, we're taking off the shelf stuff and trying to you know modify it to make it where it'll work, and, and you know, and but the thing about it is. And I always like to try to look at the bright side of things. This project, even though it didn't really work out exactly the way I was hoping, it taught me so much about engineering. It I, taught you, know, you about little, electronics. It, it, uh, yeah, yeah. You you know more about electronics um, than the average person does out there, unless somebody does it for a living. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. they do it for a living, that's different. But yeah. when it comes to, mean, to the average person, you, you definitely know, I mean, most people don't know the difference in AC or DC or, or, or you know, or waveforms or any of that. So they're right. clueless on it. Right. And, but exactly. you don't need to, you don't need to have that to, I don't yeah. need to know what, a, what, what kind of waveform or, or what happens when I turn a light switch on. If I turn something on and it works, that's the end result. That's all you care about. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, the point of it is, I mean, hell, it's just one of those things where, you know, if, Hell, we we got basically we got the uh, engineers engineer. I mean, a guy that t that trains engineers, and he's sitting there kind of going, "Oh, I don't know what the hell's going on here, but it's not what you think it is, you know." And I'm, oh, but it's okay. not what he thought it was either, was it? it no, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, we had him stop. I mean, and this guy, you know, and he was no idiot. This guy was super no. intelligent. Hell no, yeah, no idiot. yeah. So, but uh, Bill, as far as um, 
somebody that I've met in person. I mean, I, I can count engineers on because I've worked with a lot of them. And I can count on the engineers on one hand um, out, out, of, out of over 40 years of doing this professionally. Um, I can count all the engineers on one hand and not even use up all the fingers that I thought were just freaking exceptional. And Bill oh, yeah. was, was at the top of that pyramid. Other guys I, I was with were, R, were RF engineers because, of course, you know, before I retired for the last um, 15 years, I worked strictly in RF and communication. And um, but that's a different story because, I, you know, I started off, I learned this by myself, electronics. It was something that was a bug for me. And, and um, I wound up going to before I knew you, I wound up going to work in television shops. I mean, I was working on televisions whenever tubes. And um, yeah. I, was, I learned to, to repair televisions as far as back as 1968. That's how far back I go. I would go get oh, shit. Uh, no shit, dude. I'd go. I'd get televisions off tube televisions off the side of the road. People were throwing them out. And I had televisions that people throw out to like 1955 television. Finally went out yeah. on. They set it on the curb. I brought it. My, my parents raised hell. What is this junk you're bringing here? And um, just by going to the library and understanding the basic functions of it um i was i was able to understand how the television worked what it was supposed to do and mm -hmm. i was able to fix power supplies in them uh realign tuners and stuff like that and every room in our house had a television in it they're all black mm -hmm. and white <laughs> and my parents were like yeah. oh, look what he can do this guy can fix you know and then um when i i, I took it electronics when i was in high school um when i through through my through the tech classes my last couple of years and then I got on 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 the job training. I did electrical for a while, and then I went to work in a television shop. And I stayed in television. Between that, because man, like I said, I'm a guy that wears many hats, and um, you know, many things interest me. You know that. I mean, hell, I I, I traveled full time, um, playing music professionally. I did that all my life. And so, in between right. doing all of that, I was doing working. I would always had a job. When you got a skill like that, you always have a job. I'd come off of the road. We take. Um, Two, th two weeks or three weeks off from traveling, I would come back, television shops, you know, it was like, hey, would you like to come in and make some money? Yeah. And if, if I wasn't with a band traveling or if I was playing locally, my ass was working full time, repairing television, microwave ovens, VCRs, um, you name it, I did it. And that, that time I wasn't an engineer and that didn't happen until I got into RF and started working in communications. And then um, all of that was, was designed. I, I was doing a lot of passive uh, design for the cable industry and a lot of the stuff I designed is kind of funny. It's still out there to this day, still being used. Some of the stuff I designed, but I, I worked yeah. other under engineers and find out, um, I got, I, I became an associate engineer and, um, I did, I did all the, the grunt work for them. They did, they did the, the, the line amp work and stuff like that. I did all the, the filtering and EQ design, but I could also work on line amps and do all that with them. But, uh, it, it was my introduction, excuse me, to work with CAD programs and designing on CAD and stuff like that. So it all paid off. But going back right. to the stuff you and I did, man, I mean, man, I think of all the crap we did. Uh, the Bedini motor, <clears throat> um, that was one of the things. Um, oh, there, there's so many. I just lost CAD. I got so much stuff here. It's off the charts. I found old papers and stuff here where you would order stuff and it was Xeroxes of Xeroxes. Of stuff people say like oh yeah i built this up you'll you'll yeah. be off the power grid forever you know, a lot of it was just total rubbish you know right. because you didn't have an internet back then and uh, speaking of the internet man I, and I'm, I'm sure this has got to be a, a three-letter agency doing this a lot of people originally were putting stuff out they would get up there and experiment as i had mentioned the molar motor and people right. put other stuff up there um uh other stuff out there, Wits Industries, all these people try to put all this stuff out where they're building uh, closed loop systems or stuff like that. And now, dude, you can't, if you type in over Unity on YouTube, it's all a freaking joke. It's yeah. all, it's, a it's like, show. it's yeah. a clown show. It's no, don't insult, don't, don't insult, don't insult clown clowns. Shows. Yeah, yeah. But and it, it's just the stupidest bullshit you ever wanted to see. And it really pisses me off because, right. Um, it should have been a good tool for people to be able to go get information. I mean, I got the gasifier stuff off there. I got the, the Mueller motor stuff off there. Man, I've uh, YouTube has been a classroom for me. And speaking of that, you can find you can find college courses 
that 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 you can replay from the beginning to end on physics, uh, electrical engineering, electronics, um, plumbing, you name it, man. You type it in there, you can find it, dude. When I built, when we put the extension to my shop out here, um, I went on YouTube and and, and self taught myself. It took me a day to do it in mm -hmm. in vinyl siding. And when yeah. I went out there and done it, there wasn't any questions of how I had to cut it, what I had to measure. And when I was done with it, it looked like I paid somebody to come out here and do this shit for me. Yeah, and exactly. So YouTube to me is a playground of, of a wealth of information. 